Welcome to today's forum. Our forum will be recorded and will be available for viewing later on our YouTube channel. The forums are Zoom webinars, which are a little different than the meetings you've attended. Your audio and video will be off. The chat function is disabled. Mr. Brinzer would like to get your feedback, so there'll be several places where he'll stop to answer questions. Please use the Q&A function to type your questions or comments, and then remember to click the send button. You won't see other people's questions, only your own, but please feel free to write any questions or comments you have in that Q&A function. Rob Bridger is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland, as well as the U.S. Navy's basic underwater demolition SEAL school. He served on a Navy SEAL team and saw cam combat in both Africa and Afghanistan. His presentation today will focus on the core attributes that enabled him to have a successful career in the SEAL teams and how those attributes were directly translatable into a successful civilian career. I'm pleased to introduce you to Mr. Rob Brinzer. Thank you. 15%. This is the average graduation rate from Navy SEAL training or BUDS. Right now there are over 90 people signed into this webinar. If all of us at this moment in time went to Navy SEAL training, at most, only 13 of us would graduate. So today, we're going to figure out if everyone on this call, if you have the mental qualities that would put you as part of the three, as part of the 70 to 80, or part of the 13 who would graduate Navy SEAL training. So what is BUDS? Today's not gonna to be about cool bud stories. It's always enjoyable, but that's not the main focus of today. But a high level awareness of what the training is will help. So bud stands for basic underwater demolition seal training. It's an approximately 32 week long training course in Coronado, California, consisting of three phases. Prior to starting the first phase or classing up, students start in dock indoctrination, which is a light regimen of daily conditioning. It's, it's almost a BUDS light. Uh, it's designed to help those coming into BUDS from the fleet where you have limited opportunities for physical training and preparation. And indoc has been very effective at reducing overuse injuries, such as stress fractures that often eliminate high potential individuals. So the first phase of BUDS is called the conditioning phase. And that's where the majority of candidates are weeded out through quitting or dropping on request. Almost the entirety of this phase consists of physical conditioning. You have weekly four mile time runs, weekly two mile ocean swims that are timed and weekly timed obstacle course runs. Students will spend plenty of time doing log PT, inflatable boat drills and drown proofing. Drown proofing is a unique drill. You can see it in the upper left part of your screen where the student's hands are tied behind their back and their feet are tied together. They're then tossed into the pool and you're expected to tread water, swim laps, and even recover items from the bottom of the pool with your teeth. Students can expect to spend upwards of four consecutive hours in the pool while tied up. So it's a skill that definitely warrants practice prior to going to buds. The fifth week of first phase it's called Hell Week, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail later on. After Hell Week, you still have four weeks of first phase training left, but you get the coveted brown shirt, which refers to the color of the t-shirt you wear under your utilities while training. The white shirts haven't completed Hell Week, but the brown shirts have, and there's a tremendous sense of pride and respect that you earn when you're going through training wearing the brown shirt. Post Hell Week, students also learn the basics of what's called hydrographic reconnaissance. It's a, uh, it's a throwback to the UD2, UDT teams and the work they did clearing the beaches of Normandy during World War II. The second phase of BUDS is eight weeks long. 
This is the combat diving phase. Students gain proficiency in basic scuba diving, and they learn how to operate the Draeger closed circuit dive system. And a closed circuit system simply means that you're breathing pure oxygen, and when you exhale, your breath goes through one tube, one hose into a canister full of a CO2 scrubber, and then back in. So it keeps all of the air and the oxygen you're breathing in a self-contained loop so no bubbles come to the surface. This phase also has the infamous shark week where students are subjected to tests of increasing difficulty underwater. You'll do ditch and don where you're underwater and you have to take off your gear and then put it back on. You'll do buddy swaps where there'll be one set of gear, two divers. So one diver will take off the gear and give it to the other diver while both of you are sharing the, uh, the regulator. And this is all done blindfolded, wearing a blackout mask. And that this week culminates with several days of what we call sharking by the instructors, where the instructors will swim down, they'll turn off your air, take off your mask, tie knots into your hoses, spin you around, loosen straps, and then give you the tap where you have to fix the situation. And this really ensures candidates have the ability to problem solve and remain calm underwater, even if you don't have any air or oxygen to breathe. There's also a very rigorous academic portion to the training. Students are tested on dive physics, dive medicine. All the tests are graded and minimum passing scores are required in order to continue the training. Students also learn the fundamentals of combat diving gaining the ability to navigate underwater using a compass and a depth gauge, which is a lot more difficult than it actually sounds. The conditioning continues. You have faster minimum passing times for your weekly runs, swims, and obstacle course. And second phase culminates with a seven mile open ocean swim that's got a pass fail time limit of four hours. And then you get the third phase. Third phase is the land warfare phase where the students gain basic proficiency with the standard issue weapons of the teams, pistols, rifles, grenades, automatic weapons, et cetera. You go through a very intense demolitions course. You learn the basics of constructing, placing, using demolition charges. You cover academic theory of explosives, like charge calculations and blast distances. And all these tests are graded. And again, minimum passing scores are required in order to graduate. The final four weeks are spent at San Clemente Island, where the intensity of the training actually increases as students approach the finish line. You're taught basic small unit tactics, additional weapons training. You learn how to plan and execute reconnaissance and assault missions, learning all the fundamentals for mission planning and small unit operations. And the physical conditioning gets harder. Passing times continue to decrease for all of your weekly timed runs, swims, and the obstacle course. You also have the shark swim, where students do a midnight swim in the channel between San Clemente Island and Catalina Island, which is notorious for being one of the world's largest breeding grounds for great white sharks. I can tell you we had fast times for that swim. After all this, you graduate buds. Congratulations. Are you a SEAL? No, not even close. You have at least six more months of additional training. If you're an officer, you go to a junior officer training course, which is five weeks. You go to Army Airborne School, and at the risk of offending uh, any Army veterans in the audience, we used to joke that Army Airborne School was a four-day course crammed into three weeks. Um, you have SEAL qualification training another very rigorous course, several months long, where you're learning advanced weapons, training, and tactics. And at the end of that, students receive their trident and are officially designated as SEALs. After that, you have more training, Arctic warfare training, where you spend several weeks in Kodiak, Alaska, learning how to survive, move, and fight in a very harsh, unforgiving Arctic environment. And then you report to your team. So BUDS and the whole training pipeline, it's, it's very physically demanding, but it really, I, I think it's more of a mental challenge. Any reasonably fit individual, I think can make it through one day of training. The challenge is to see that light at the far, far end of the tunnel and persevere knowing that 
at the end, the, the suffering, it's worth it. So there's the intro on what BUDS is. I wanted to stop here and see if we have any questions before we talk about really the meat of everything, which is what it takes to succeed at BUDS and more. Yes, Rob, this is Christy. We've had uh, two questions come in. The first is, how does SEAL training differ from astronaut training? That's a tough one for me because I haven't done astronaut training. Um, I'm going to default and say SEAL training is harder. <laughs> um, I, I really don't know. Um, I know that um, there's a gentleman recently that I never had the privilege of meeting, but he served as a SEAL. Then he went to Harvard Medical School, and now he's an astronaut. Um, so he's one of those guys that's out there accomplishing all his dreams. So the rest of us mortals don't, don't have to, um, but I, I'm sorry, I don't really have an answer for astronaut training, though. I imagine it's quite rigorous and difficult. Okay. Uh, how many students get into the program during a typical training year? You know, I think they've accelerated or the, the number of classes, but when I went through, they were doing about five classes per year and the class size varied between 100 and 250 to start. And generally speaking, it's about 15 to 20% is, is what graduates. Okay, do SEALs maintain conditioning after BUDS? Yes, um, that's one thing that I really miss about being in the, in the teams is that your typical day is always, it's always different. Some weeks you're shooting, some weeks you're diving, some weeks you're jumping. Um, but you're always training. But the start of every day from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. was physical conditioning, PT. And that, that it didn't matter if you had email to check or meetings to go to. Even if you're on the road tr uh, training, the first hour to two hours of every day was, was a platoon PT session. So somebody wants to know, during training, do you ever think about dropping out? I think everybody has those thoughts. Um, generally the people that succeed and, and finish training, um, take those thoughts and give them no voice. Um, it's, uh, you don't want to let those thoughts grow too loud in your head because you can pretty much talk yourself into anything you want. How are people treated once they drop out? With respect, um, as, as a student, you never really see the people that drop out. They just seem to disappear and they go back to uh, whatever job they were doing in the Navy before the training. Uh, there's, no, there's no professional shame in, in dropping out um, simply for the fact that most people don't make it. Do, does anybody ever die or drown, people are asking? Occasionally, it's, it's rare. Um, although the training, and th I'll, this will be the last question for now, and then we'll, we'll jump back in, but we have a few more spots for, for questions. But um, the training may look like chaos, and as a student, it feels like chaos. But behind the scenes, it is very well scripted. The instructors have tables for exposure. How long can the students stay in the water before they have to come out? How much sleep do they need to get? When do they have to eat? Um, so all the drills, all the, the evolutions are, are really well scripted. And although they are dangerous, for sure, there's a lot of safety precautions that are taken behind the scenes. Still, accidents do happen, unfortunately. Not very frequently, though. Okay. We only have a few others. We'll catch them another time. Somebody okay. is asking about how you got involved or what was your inspiration. Hopefully, you'll talk about that at some point. I, I will. We can make that the, uh, the first question. Okay, great. I am trying to share the screen again here. One moment. There we go. All right. So what does it take to succeed at BUDS? But not just at BUDS, but in life and everything you do. Because even if you spend a full 20 years of, in the teams, there's life afterwards. And there's a reason, in my opinion, that so many SEALs enjoy or earn great success during their careers after the teams. And I think it's because of two traits. And the first is personal accountability. And the second is discipline. 
So what is personal accountability? It's a conscious choice. It's a conscious choice to accept responsibility for everything in your life. And this isn't a choice that you make once. It's a choice that you have to make over and over again every day of your life. It's a conscious choice to refuse to ever allow yourself to become a victim. It's a conscious choice to refuse to ever feel sorry for yourself. It's a conscious choice to refuse to exert even a single ounce of your precious energy or your time looking for someone else or something else to blame. So the, the poem Invictus, I, I hope a lot of people are familiar with this, the poem by Henley. I think the last two lines of this poem really sum up what I was trying to say. It's that I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. So, so why is this important? Personal accountability is, it's the core of leadership. And we'll, we'll talk about leadership a little more later, but it's what people mean when they say leaders lead from the front. And it, it doesn't mean you have to be physically in the front. It doesn't mean you have to be involved in every decision. It doesn't even mean that you have to be designated as a formal leader. It means you just need to act like one, leading by example, by taking complete personal accountability for your life. And that accountability is tough because if your platoon fails, if your team fails, if your department or your business fails and you're the leader, it's your fault. Success, on the other hand, means all the credit goes to your team, not you. And this requires you to be less concerned with things like glory and accolades or personal recognition. Instead, your focus is on your team and success of the mission. And if you're a leader like this, you will earn the trust and respect of not only your senior leadership and your peers, but your team. So here's an example from Buds. So on the screen, you see some pictures of log PT. And this is brutal and it's difficult. You have long sessions with your log. And, and to be honest, I dislike log PT more than anything else we did at Buds. So each boat crew, which is a group of four to six students and usually led by an officer, has their own log. Uh, and these are, these are essentially cut down telephone poles. Um, and you do lots of exercises with these logs. And the instructors are quite creative at, at the sort of uh, painful exercises you are required to do. But I remember specifically once during Hell Week, we had an eight hour straight log PT evolution. And we lost a lot of people on that evolution. But hardly any officers quit. And the officer success rate at BUDS is actually much higher than the enlisted. Why is that? Are they, are they better prepared? I didn't feel like I was any more prepared than a lot of the enlisted guys in my class. We're required to have higher test scores. We get more attention from the instructors. So why? And I think the answer is that officers are required to lead their teams, which means they're thinking about their teams first and themselves second. I didn't have time to feel sorry for myself. I didn't have time to feel like a victim. I didn't have the mental energy to sink into that self-absorbed shell because I was so worried about how's my team doing? Do I need to motivate them? Controlling what we could control as a team, ensuring that we were performing as well as we could. And I think when you act like that and you're leading like that, you, you're able to surpass any sort of physical challenges and, and being uncomfortable. And you really do become the master of your fate and the captain of your soul. So I'm going to relate uh, a personal story about this um, from, from the business that I'm currently running. Um, it's the, the business RSI. It's part of CoolSys. And I'll talk about that a little later. But when I came on board, we had a problem here with 
at fault vehicle accidents. We have at any given moment, 80 technicians out on the road driving and we were wrecking vehicles left and right. So we implemented a new safe driving program. We required every driver to go through a hands-on course. Not only that, any new hires had to complete this course prior to getting the keys to their vehicle. And I told this to my office manager. About a week later, we hired two new folks and somehow they both got the keys without taking the training. And in their first weeks on the job, they both rear-ended other vehicles on the road. I was furious. So I went and I talked to the office manager and I expressed my displeasure and disappointment with myself. I took accountability for it because this is my business, my team. And I told her that I had failed. I had failed to impress upon her the importance of the driving training. I needed to do a better job in the future, being clear and concise with my expectations and validating that she understood. And as you can imagine, my, my staff was, they, they were surprised. This is not a common reaction from, a, from a, a leader. But what's interesting is what happened in the months that followed. This attitude started to propagate through our organization. And I can tell you now, nine months later, my entire staff takes total personal accountability. There's no blame ever passed in this organization. And this, this is proof when, when leaders lead by example, good or bad, these actions and expectations propagate all the way down through the organization. And it's, it's very exciting to me that we have evolved in a very short time to an organization where personal accountability is now evident at all levels. One other important note about this, just because you're the leader of a group does not mean that you're supposed to know everything. Nobody expects you to. Leaders that act like that, that act like they know everything, they know best all the time, their teams quickly see them for what they are, and that's a fraud. Oftentimes when a leader makes a mistake, they're reluctant to even own up to it in front of their team. Why? Generally, it's because they're insecure as a leader. They're worried that if, they, if they're wrong, if they make a mistake, they'll look weak. But the opposite is true. Usually, your team already knows you made a mistake. But when you acknowledge that mistake and you correct it, you earn additional trust and respect from your team. And this applies in my personal life as well. Um, Pre-COVID, we, we have four kids at home. We have an 11 year old, an eight year old, a six year old and a two year old. So our, our home is chaos. Um, when we were trying to get the kids to school in the morning, it's, it's just a disaster zone. We're packing lunches, we're trying, trying to find shoes, let alone tie them, make sure the kids are dressed according to the school dress code. We're rushing to get out the door. We never leave on time. I'm worrying about the lights and traffic and trying to get these kids to school. And I get frustrated and the kids are like, dad's always yelling at us to move faster. And when I take a look at this, it's my fault. It's my fault. I need to own this situation at home. And so when I take the time and the discipline to pack the kids' lunches at night, we're never late. We're never rushed. And that's, that's a super small example, right? But that's, that's an overarching principle for life is that when there's a situation that is difficult, take accountability for it look at it. What can you do to make the situation better? Don't focus on what other people are doing wrong. Focus on what changes you can make. So um, this leads us into discipline, the other attribute for success, but I thought this might be a good spot here to also pause for questions. Okay, great. So um, let's see. Does, uh, the, does the show SEAL Team on TV give a good representation of what SEAL teams do? I, I've seen a few episodes, um, not, not a lot, um, kind of, right? I, I liked how the show shows a lot of the personal life and it's, it's kind of surreal because you have a normal family life and that's 
one of the things that talks is talked a lot about in Virginia Beach and in, in Coronado. It's that your next door neighbor, you know, he takes out the trash, he plays with his kids, but he's a SEAL. So when he goes home, to, when he goes to work, sometimes he doesn't come home for a few weeks and he's off doing some pretty exciting stuff. Um, so I like that aspect of it. It really humanizes the guys. And that's very, very true. Um, and the missions, the, the few scenes that I've seen seem to be realistic and accurate. It's just that, and it's part of it's the movie framework. It's never the same platoon doing all this stuff all the time. Um, so that's, that's a very crazy op tempo that they're showing. But yeah, from what I saw, it seems fairly realistic. So we got a couple of questions here about officers and enlisted men training yeah. together. Do they train together and how do the officer, if so, how do the officers treat the enlisted men of the team? That's a great question. To my knowledge, it's the only training in the military where officer, excuse me, officers and enlisted go through it together. Um, it's a first name basis, which is also a military anomaly. So I would call my guys Dave, JT, Bo, and they'd call me Rob. But what the teams seems to develop is that everybody knows when you're supposed to turn on the, the military bearing. And so if even you know, after training, when you're in a platoon, it's a first name basis. But if there's an outsider present, if you're presenting in front of a group, all of a sudden I'm calling them petty officer and chief and they're calling me lieutenant. And so you turn on that military bearing when it's appropriate, but the majority of the time, it, it really is a, a very close knit first name basis kind of group. Someone wants to know if training is continuing with COVID-19 in place. <laughs> yes, I know, I know for a fact it is continuing. Um, I doubt that, I doubt that they've changed the thing, to be honest. Which services are eligible to undergo this kind of training? So only Navy personnel, but you can also transfer into the Navy as a lateral transfer from any of the uh, other branches of the service. So we had people that were Marines, transferred into the Navy, became a petty officer, and then uh, went through training. Can you talk quickly about your inspiration to become a SEAL in the first place? Sure. I, I knew that I wanted to give back and, and serve the country, and I knew that from, I don't know, a, a very young age. Um, I knew I wanted to go to the Naval Academy. Um, it just looked like something that I wanted to do. And I thought, well, what interests me? And the teams, first of all, it was, it was getting through the training. It was a challenge. And I like challenges. Um, and then I thought, well, if I'm going to serve in the military and I'm going to be in harm's way, I want to be in harm's way with the most well-trained, competent individuals that, that I could find. And that led me to the teams. I was fortunate enough to get a billet to go to BUDS when I graduated Annapolis and was able to graduate. And I'll tell you, the men that I served with, just the top notch, just outstanding individuals and um, very grateful for that opportunity. Okay, so we got one last question here. Do most SEALs come from a prior competitive swimming background? No, I mean, I didn't. Um, I mean, I grew up swimming, but not competitively. Um, my wife swims twice as fast as I do. Um, no, you, you see all sorts. You see football players, basketball players, runners. You see people that are just in good shape, but never really did any sports. It's, um, it's really more about what's, what's inside, not, not the sports that you've done. Okay, thanks, Rob. On with the show. All right. Go back to sharing. Okay. Now we're gonna talk about discipline. So if personal accountability is this framework that we're talking about uh, around which you're building your life, then discipline, it, it's the engine that drives it forward. It's the motive power that propels you. So, so what is discipline? It's, it's again, it's a conscious decision. It's a decision to exercise rationality in your life. And by rationality, I mean, not living by the moment, 
guided by your emotions, which, which are important. They're, they're what makes us human, but they shouldn't be what guides your decisions. It's the rationality to develop goals and long range plans to understand what's required to accomplish those goals and plans and then to do it. At our core, all of us, we, we all know in any given situation what is right, what is necessary, what needs to be done. But these things are typically hard. They require hard work, effort, often over a sustained period of time. We also know what's easy, the easy road, the, the lazy road, the road frequently traveled. And I think discipline is choosing the hard road every time. But where does it come from? So in the military, there's discipline and, and it comes from the rigid framework. And it, I think it's easy to be disciplined when you're in the military or you're in jail, right? You have to, otherwise there are, there are consequences that are imposed upon you. But what if you've never been in the military or jail? Um, or what if you leave the military? What about after? Where does the discipline come from when you don't have this rigid construct around you that sort of forces you to be disciplined? So it comes from inside. Discipline is internal. And the more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. It's like a muscle. And it's important. It's, I think it's so unbelievably important because it enables you to accomplish more, to be more, to learn more, to do more with your life, more than you thought you could do. And a person with discipline, I think, will invariably, in the long run, maximize their potential as a human being. So let's do an example from Buds. Hell Week. So our Hell Week was Saturday in October through a Thursday in November. And Halloween was that Wednesday. Um, some of my memories are blurry, but I do remember that our class had to carry around about a 50 pound jack-o'-lantern all day Wednesday as a punishment for ruining the instructor's Halloween. But Hell Week is tough. You are, you are cold and wet the entire time. You have bloody blisters on your feet and your elbows and knees are rubbed raw from the sand. You don't sleep. We slept for 45 minutes on Wednesday afternoon. That's it. You're constantly doing physical activity. One of the, one of the evolutions was a 10 hour marathon that we had to run with those inflatable boats that you see there on the screen. Um, most of your meals are MREs. It's those meals ready to eat. I remember eating them while sitting in the surf zone with those boats on top of our heads. So it's difficult. And the instructors, they, they rotate shifts every eight hours. So you always have a fresh set of instructors coming on. The worst was by far the night shift. When you have, a, you have the fresh crew that comes out and makes you stand on the sand dunes and wave goodbye to the sun as it sets. And that's very demoralizing. We, we even used to theorize that the budge instructors had weather machines that allowed them to control the weather in Coronado. Um, and we received conclusive proof of this. Budge class 239, which was one class after mine, 238, during their hell week, it snowed. In Coronado, San Diego, it snowed. So that was all the proof that we needed that the instructors had uh, supernatural powers or some sort of weather machine. But what I, what I want to show here is a, is a graphic illustrating the, the, the brutal nature of Hell Week and the effect it has on class size. So here you can see week one, day one for our class. And we had 220 candidates. And after the first week of training, We went down to 180 candidates. So at the start of week two, we went down to 160 candidates. At the start of week four, we were then down to 140. And then at the start of hell week, we were down to 120 candidates. So in four weeks, we lost 100 men. 
And in the first 24 hours of Hell Week, we had 40 quitters. And we were down to 80 candidates. Two days in, down to 55. 25 more men quit on the second day. And three days in, we're down to 40 candidates, another 15 quitters. Interestingly enough, no quitters for the last two and a half days. And this is actually, I found out later, typical. Hardly anybody quits after the third day of training. The last two and a half days, the whole focus there is putting the remaining men through the paces, giving them the opportunity to join the club and to have their full five and a half days of hell week. But if we look at the rest of the class, finishing first phase, second phase, and third phase, we finish with 22. So big picture, we started with 220, and the men in blue were the 22 who graduated. So how is this possible? We talked about this before. Discipline requires the setting of long range goals, of understanding what's required and then doing it. In order to become a SEAL, you have to complete Hell Week. And it's the ultimate test, at least it was for me, of choosing the hard road, the road of accomplishment and success and not the easy road. So here's an example from my personal life. I talked about this uh, briefly before um, with kids, right? That's, that's not our family, but the way the parents look there is how I feel every day. Um, that's the one thing Buds doesn't prepare you for is having kids. Um, and, and we're busy. Mondays and Wednesdays are soccer. Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays are swim team. Mondays and Fridays and Sundays are cross country. One of my children, he does a shooting club that I'm a coach for on Saturdays and sometimes on Sundays. And getting ready for practice, like getting ready for school, can be crazy. We're looking for gear, trying to find uniforms, looking through the dirty laundry for a clean or relatively clean soccer shirt. Um, discipline solves this problem. And I know that if I exert the discipline to work with my kids after practice, to get their stuff put away in the proper spot. Then the next practice looks like this, where we're the happy family and things are easy, smooth, and pleasant. And I wanna give a full disclaimer here, this does not happen all the time. And when it does, it's typically because my wife has taken care of stuff and I haven't. And I have to be completely transparent about that. So it's, it's an opportunity for me to exercise better discipline, contribute more to our family and it's just one of those things that if I'm honest with myself, I can do a better job at. And so the challenge to the whole group here is to take a look at your life and look at what you have going on and find an area where you can implement discipline. You can choose the hard road, but the right road and try to stick with it for 21 days. And I challenge you to tell me that your life hasn't improved significantly. So on the last slide, I have uh, my name and I have my personal email address and my LinkedIn profile. And so if anybody is interested, send me a note on that and tell me what, uh, what you decided to do for your 21 days and we can correspond that way and, and see. And it'll probably inspire me to figure out more ways that I can be more disciplined in my life. All right, we have time for a few more questions. Okay, we actually had three questions come in a row about women. Women do, uh, are there women that make it through the program? Um, how many have graduated over the years? Great question. So, BUDS was recently, in the last few years, opened up to women. Same standards, same expectations. Now, before you go to BUD, something I didn't really talk about earlier is there's a selection process that you have to go through that qualifies you to go to BUD's training. Um, to my knowledge, and maybe there's breaking news that I'm unaware of, but to my knowledge, a few women have applied to that selection process, but I don't believe anybody, any, any women have made it through 
at this point. So it is still an, at this point, an all male community. Is there a high divorce rate among SEALs? Yes. Yes, there is. Um, from what I understand, it's, it's well over 70%. Um, and that's due to, and I, I actually will talk about this a bit later. So maybe we table that one and I'll kind of refer back to this question um, when we get to that. Okay. How long were you on active duty? I was on active duty for five years after I graduated school. And then I spent three years in the inactive reserves when I decided to get out. Okay, and one last question. Do people ever reapply if they've dropped out? Is that even allowed? It is. Um, it's, it's, it's really, I think it depends on the circumstances for which you dropped out. Um, but yes, I do know of people that have failed and they have to go back to the fleet for a period of time and then they are able to come back and sometimes they make it and, and sometimes they don't. That's all we have for now. Okay, perfect. So I decided to leave the Navy and the SEAL teams in 2006. And the reason for me was that I wanted a family. And this refers back to that, that question we just had. I, I wanted a family, but I wanted one where I could be present as a husband and as a father. And in the teams, the, the operating tempo is, is very high. You're, you're gone a lot. A, a quick example, I mean, I can think of my last three years and I was away from home probably 30 out of those 36 months. And it's not all overseas. You might go down to Key West for eight weeks of diving training. And then you're home for four days. I lived in Virginia Beach at the time. And then you're down to Mississippi for a shooting school for six weeks. And then you're back for a week. And then you head up to Nevada for some driving training for five weeks. And then you come back. So you have this, you're always training and preparing for deployment with minimal time at home. And then you deploy. And as a SEAL, and I think especially as a SEAL officer, you have to place your job first. It has to be at the top of your priority list. You're responsible for this platoon. You're making decisions that can directly impact people's lives. So that has to be your number one priority. You have a training trip or you have a t-ball game to go to. It's gonna be the training trip. There's a birthday or deployment. It's gonna be the deployment. And that's just not, I didn't, I don't want to live in both of those worlds at the same time where I was having kids, but I was never there. Um, and of course, referring to that comment earlier about the divorce rate, um, there are a lot of divorces and I don't think it's from any particular bad decisions that any individuals make as much as it's hard to maintain a relationship for a long period of time when you are absent so much. So, so I started to look to get out and I struggled with this a lot. What were my transferable skills? I had a computer science degree from Annapolis, but it was obsolete and I didn't like it. So that was out. Um, proficiency with demolitions and explosives does not fit onto a resume. Firearm expertise also not really a resume bullet in good shape. Sure but that has no relevance to a job. And it's hard to build a good resume around personal accountability and discipline. But what I finally realized was leadership was the absolute most relevant transferable skill that I had developed in my time at Annapolis and at SEAL training and then in the teams. And, and to be honest, it, it's something that I continue to understand more and more. Um, I've had many opportunities in the corporate world to see the negative impact that poor leadership can have on a team and performance and financial results. But I've also had the opportunity to see the transformative impact that leadership has, good leadership has on business as well. So a bit about my, my personal life. Um, 
there, so there's a picture of my family. I, I wanted to, to put them up and, and, and show them. That's my, my wife, Jenny, Jennifer. She, she grew up in Sacramento, went to St. Francis High School. Um, and those are our kids. So from the left to the right, there's, there's Chase, he's 11, Lyra, who's six, Layton, who's eight, and then our baby girl, Adeline, who just turned two last week. That is one of the very few pictures of me actually in the teams. This was before the iPhone era. I'm dating myself, I guess. Um, but that was in taken in Afghanistan. Um, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania and then went to Annapolis and graduated Bud's class 238. Earned my SEAL Trident in 2002 and then spent four additional years serving as, as a SEAL officer. So when I decided to leave active duty, I found a job with GE um, in Sacramento. And my wife was very happy about that. She had given up everything to move with me to Virginia Beach for a while. And she was just couldn't be happier to move back to her hometown. So I worked for 13 years for GE. Um, during that time, I, I went back to school at Sac State and worked towards my piano performance degree. And I actually remember performing a Beethoven sonata for this group in 2011. Um, and then in 2017, I earned my MBA with George Washington University, um, transferred to CoolSys where I run their RSI business in NorCal. And then I founded two companies since then. Uh, last year I founded Clean Coast Resources, which is an environmental services and alternative energy corporation. And then this year, my business partner and I founded Add Value Partners, and it's a, a management consulting company that also does leadership consulting. Um, so I wanted to spend just, just a few minutes on this um, because number one, I'm proud of my family and I wanted to show a picture of them. Um, but I'm also proud of the accomplishments that I've had since I left the teams. And it's not, not to pat myself on the back, uh, it's to show that I think if you incorporate personal accountability and discipline into your life, I think you can accomplish a lot more than, than you really think is possible. So very briefly, um, are there any questions about what I just talked about there? If not, no problem, we can just keep pushing on. Actually, there is a good question here that is in, in line with that. It says, Has, was accepting responsibility always part of your makeup or a lot did you attribute a lot of that to your overall training? I think it's a combination of, of both. Um, I had really good parents that raised me. Um, they were very hardworking people and I don't ever remember them making excuses. I don't know that they ever talked about personal accountability specifically, but they led by example. Um, and, and so I just, I kind of had that attitude, I think, uh, I think mostly from them and Maybe it's just how I'm wired. Um, and then it was certainly reinforced with my, with my time in the Navy. Um, I, yeah, I think that's just kind of how I worked out. That's all that we have for right now, Rob. Go ahead. Okay. Very good. I think I got the hang of this screen sharing thing. All right. So we're going to talk about leadership. And we could probably spend, especially if it was one where we could all talk to each other uh, hours, days talking about leadership, how important it is, how difficult it is. But I wanted to pick one key component of leadership and, and talk about that. And so those that may have be, um, that are veterans may have heard of commander's intent. Um, it's something it's otherwise known as decentralized command. Uh, it's a concept that, that I first learned about at Annapolis and I have seen it presented in various forms in almost every leadership course and book I've ever read. But what is it? War is chaos. It is absolutely unpredictable. The unexpected always happens at the most inopportune time. It's, it's Murphy's Law. And you have to have an effective leadership framework that empowers the people on the ground, your field leaders, to adapt and overcome all, all of the, the challenges that unexpectedly present themselves. So on the left, you can see the typical model of leadership, centralized command. So you have information flowing 
up and down the chain of command. You have strict controls and approvals that are required before any decisions are made. And the leaders in a framework like that, they maintain strict control. And from a business perspective, you probably have very little variability, which is always a good thing. But there's almost no room for creativity, ingenuity, nor is there the ability to rapidly respond, pivot, adjust. You have inefficiencies and time delays associated with requesting approval up and down. And you just sometimes can't adapt in a timely fashion to, to things that come up. And in combat, that inability can have very severe consequences. And in the business world, <clears throat> you still, I think, have some very significant consequences. I'm sure some, some of you out there have worked for a boss that required their approval before every decision was made. Think about how that felt working in that environment. Did you feel empowered or did you feel smothered and micromanaged? Did you even have the ability to take personal accountability for your job, your projects, your outcomes, or did your boss control everything? and essentially expect you to follow orders and execute. I've, I've worked in that environment before, and I do not like it. But the commander's intent decentralized model is an alternative, a very effective alternative. And it requires that the person in charge and responsible for the overall mission is also responsible to ensure that through clear and concise communication, all of their subordinate leaders understand the overall strategic goal of the mission or the commander's intent. And they are empowered to make decisions that help achieve that goal. They do not need to ask for approval for any decisions as long as they're working towards that goal. And I'll, I'll tell you, this is far more effective and efficient than requiring subordinates to receive chain of command approval for, for all missions. So a real world example, when we were in Afghanistan up in the Northeast, we were taking down an Al-Qaeda compound and it had a very high wall around this compound in a somewhat urban area. And we identified the breach points. We divided our forces into helicopter-based sniper support and several assault teams, fast roped in outside of the compound, breached the wall, and then cleared the compound buildings. We secured it and then brought the FBI in to do all the, the evidence gathering. And it may sound complicated, but to be honest, it, pretty straightforward. Um, but it, the only way that it could work was if we had all of the assault team leaders that number one, understood the overall intent, and number two, were free to make any and all on the ground decisions without approval. And lots of stuff comes up. The house is empty, move through it to the next, support the other squads. This house is full of women and young children. Leave two seals here, secure the area, keep them safe, and the rest of the squad carry on. So you, you can see these are decisions that you don't have time to get on the radio and request permission to try to describe everything that's going on. There's information that's time sensitive and it's only available to the people on the ground. So they need to be the ones to make those decisions. In my platoon, I had snipers, breachers, corpsmen, radiomen, all sorts of specialties. Could I shoot as well as my snipers? Not a chance, but I knew enough about what they did so I could effectively employ them. And the same goes for my breachers and my corpsmen and all of these specialties. These men were experts and they needed to be recognized as such, not, not for their own egos, but because by recognizing their expertise and getting out of their way, provided they had the right intent, we were able to achieve just amazing things. Um, a common misconception of this model is that leadership loses control, that decisions are being made without their knowledge, without their approval. What if, what if something goes wrong? What if someone makes a bad decision? And this is difficult for many leaders because they don't trust their subordinates and you have to trust them. And this goes back to personal accountability. 
you hear the excuses. My leaders are too inexperienced. Well, then you need to figure out how to train them to get them the experience. Well, they're making decisions that don't align with our overall strategic objective. Well, then you need to communicate clearly what your objective is and verify understanding. My leaders are making decisions outside of their span of control. Well, then you need to clearly set the boundaries for them so they know what they can and what they can't do. So again, it goes back to that personal accountability of the individual leader. So if I was to summarize everything we've discussed today, I'd say that the two attributes most important to succeeding not only at BUDS, but in life are personal, personal accountability and discipline. And in tandem, they can empower individuals to maximize their potential as human beings. And as far as transferable skills from the SEAL teams, we just scratched the surface, but without a doubt, I think leadership is at the top of that list. So I know we have, I think, a few more minutes for some final questions, and I'm, I'm gonna leave it open here. Um, we talked about that 21 day challenge. If, if you'd like, please take down my email or my LinkedIn profile. I don't really do Facebook or anything like that. Um, but I'd love to, to hear from you and hear some of your success stories. So I think we can hit questions now until the end. Great, great information, Rob. What a life you have had. We have just a couple of minutes and a couple of questions. Here's, here, here's what they are. Do you um, do consulting to help younger people find a direction in life, such as pre-college or college students who don't know what they're interested in at all in life? Sounds like somebody might have a, a child or grandchild they need some help with, but... That's one of the questions. You know, I haven't done any of that, but that's something that to, to, to a limited point, right? I, I couldn't afford to spend 40 hours a week doing that, but that's something that I, I think would be interesting and I might be able to at least provide a good perspective of here's all the mistakes I've made. Um, but yeah, that, that sounds interesting. Okay. Can you identify the age that you were when you developed the qualities of personal accountability and discipline? Was it an event in your life that stimulated these qualities? I'm going to have to give credit to my high school cross country coach for that. Um, he was a tough coach and didn't accept excuses, didn't let you make excuses. And, and, um, and I ran cross country and track in high school and college. And that's a, that's a sport that's kind of all about suffering and enduring the suffering and pushing yourself. And this, this coach had this knack for getting the best out of every individual and I, I definitely have to put that on the list of formative experiences for me. Good so question. you said you said you were going to put up your email address. Do you have a slide to put that up? Some people is, are asking to be able to email you later. Oh, is that not sharing? Let me. Uh, it's not. Oh yeah, let me put that up right now. Great. There we go. Okay, somebody also asked, what are the three helmets symbolized that are behind you there? Oh, yeah, the, the, so those are in my office. I'm in my office at work, but uh, those are the helmets you wear during BUDS. The green one is for first phase, the blue one is for second phase, and the red one is for third phase. Um, and you have to make them yourself and you know, sand them and spray paint them and get them nice and shiny for inspections every so often, and uh, heaven forbid if you drop your helmet and it gets cracked or scratched and you got to start over from, from scratch. So um, I managed to kind of bring those with me and they're kind of a nice, nice keepsake. Okay. And let's see, how are we doing on time? I think we have just probably one, one more quick one here. Can you tell us what you did at, at GE for 13 years? And sure. Um, I started in their industrial division and I was a service manager for Northern California for their in-home appliance repair. So if you ever had a bad service experience with a GE appliance, um, my fault. <laughs> um, and then I transitioned to GE healthcare and I was a service director for the imaging service. Um, and then, then I moved to a, a sales director role for GE um, and sold service, uh, a service and technology solutions. Um, for, for GE Healthcare before I decided to leave after 13 years. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rob. You're we'll welcome. back over to our tech team. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. That was really a great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. And one of the things that I found uh, 
personally interesting was when you talk about when problems occur, focus on what you can do to make things right. I think uh, it'd be nice if more leaders had your same opinion on that. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, share our, my screen now so people can see a little bit of what we're gonna be coming up with. And a reminder that uh, today's presentation was recorded and will be available for viewing later on our Renaissance YouTube channel. You can also find that link by going to the Renaissance webpage. Um, it has links to our recordings and some of the other uh, Renaissance recordings on that page. And finally, next Friday, um, this is gonna be popular, I think. Dr. Charles Bamforth, beer, looks good, tastes good, does you good. I, I'm certainly looking forward to this one, I gotta say. I think it's gonna be a really fun, um, fun uh, form. Make sure you sign up. Uh, the cutoff is at noon on Fridays. Uh, so that's the, uh, you can sign up anytime before then. So thank you again, Rob and everyone for sharing your afternoon with us.